When I told you to think of a sponge, what came up in your mind? Maybe this thing, the one that we use to wash dishes. Yeah, that's not a sponge, by the way. I mean, not the animal sponge. That's completely synthetic. Now, if you are talking about the animal sponge, maybe you are familiar with this guy. This is SpongeBob SquarePants, based on the Aplicina. When you think about sponge, you might think of it as something soft, right? Well, that is true to some extent. There are some sponges that are not soft at all. For example, the glass sponges. So, let me brought up the question. What exactly is glass sponge? Glass sponge is still in the sponge group, of course, which is Filum porifera. While most sponges are classified in the classes Demospongiae, that is, the soft sponge, glass sponges are classified in the class Hexactinellida. They exist in all oceans, but almost every glass sponges live in deeper water, which is why you might have never encountered them. They can be shaped like a face, plate, or tube. Their size can vary between 0.5 cm in diameter, like the Opsacas minuta, and also could be quite big, like the Monora pistuni, which could grow to 3 meters long. The middle part of a glass sponge body is the coanosome, which is where they feed. The outer layer is the dermal membrane, which have a lot of pores where water and other things could enter. Between the membrane and coanosome are trabecular strands, which are networks that serve as passage into the coanosome. The coanosome have flagellated chambers, which can pump water when external currents are absent. They can grow directly from the substrate, or they can also have a stalk to anchor. That stalk is their basal spicule. We might as well talk about spicules now. What makes them hard and glassy are their spicules. In glass sponges, their spicules are made out of silicon oxide, usually with six points called hexactin, hence its class name, hexactinellida. Even so, there are many derived forms of these spicules. These spicules are distributed on their body. Think of it like a skeleton, if you will. There are two different forms of spicule skeleton that can be found in glass sponges. Some have fused spicules called dictionin, while the other have loose spicules, called lysacin. There are generally two types of spicules, the megasclares and microsclares. Megasclares are big spicules, usually bigger than 0.2 mm in diameter. Some of them are relatively really big, projected and can be seen outside their body, like the stalk that anchor to the substrate that I've shown before. Microsclerts are the small spicules, usually less than 0.1 mm in diameter. Like other sponges, these spicules are the basis of the classification, which is why, for identification, you need to observe their spicules. The form of their smaller spicules is the basis of the division of this class. The subclass Amphidiscophora have amphidisc spicules and no hexastar spicules while the hexasterophora have hexaster spicules and no amphidisc spicules. One of the unique things about them that not only is different from other sponges, but also from other animals, is that the majority of their body is composed of syncytial tissues. What that means is that, while normally tissues are composed of individual cells, their tissues are composed of fused cells. So, they have this continuous cell with no divisive membrane, but with many nuclei. This enables them to easily distribute food throughout their system, like in plants. Not only that, this enables electrical signal to travel through them, working like the nervous system of other animals, which sponges normally don't have. When they die, like many other animals, these soft tissues decay while the spicules remain. The spicules remain of glass sponges can intertwine and form a steady substrate, usually used as growth place for demo sponges. And, if you haven't noticed yet, yes, this is a reef. So, not only coral that can form reefs, sponges can also form reefs. 
There is even a project dedicated to studying sponge reef, which is called the Sponge Reef Project. As in other sponges, they also do sexual reproduction. They eject gamete cells to the water that will develop if male and female gamete cells meet. Their larva actually swims, if you haven't known that. The larva will then settle and attach themselves into a substrate to initiate development into adulthood. After attachment, they will flatten and become broader, and then development and growth of spicules can start. They also can reproduce asexually by budding, especially on sponges that don't form stall. Glass sponges actually have a long fossil record. Traces of them might be observed from the Paleophragmodicta fossil, dating back to the Vendian or Ediacaran period. More specifically, around 558 to 555 million years ago. These trace fossils show spicules impressions, which led researchers to believe they are traces of glass sponges. By the Cambrian, glass sponges were already quite diverse, while the other sponges had just started to emerge, which is why glass sponges are considered to be one of the earliest animals. There are a lot of glass sponges fossils, especially from Jurassic and Cretaceous. Even so, whole-body preservation almost never happened, as with other animal fossils. The problem is, their classification is highly based on their spicule composition, which make fossil glass sponges difficult to be clearly classified. They can live a long time. The record for the current oldest living animal is held by them. A deep-sea sponge, Monorapis chuni, is estimated to be around 11,000 years old. An age entry for Scolimastra jobini is thought to be around 15,000 years old. Because of their age, their spicule can be used to determine climate changes as time goes by. Well, at least changes in ocean condition where they live. These changes were analyzed by observing the lamellar organization and growth of their base spicule. Oh, by the way, this base spicule is huge. Just look at this image. Oh, by the way, I do recommend reading the first article that I put in the description if you want to know more about glass sponges, since it's a 145 pages resume on what is known about glass sponges, at least until 2007. And so, there you go. What might seem to be a simple animal is actually quite complex and very different from any other animals. Even so, we don't really have much information of them, since they live in deep ocean and it's quite difficult to observe. Who knows what discoveries will we make in the future? But for now, let's just learn what is known. And that's all for now.